discoveries in particle physics we've been talking about relied typically on one of two different sources of particles. Either they used particles from radioactive decay or they looked at cosmic rays. And the problem is, by the time we were getting to the end of the 1940s and early 50s, these sources ran into some pretty significant limitations. Now, for radioactive decay, the limitation was that of energy. The energy from radioactive decay comes from one nucleus decaying into another, and so you're limited by the energy difference between these two nuclei, and that typically can't exceed more than a few mega electron volts. Now, an electron volt, if you're not familiar with it, is the energy gained by an electron when it's accelerated through a potential difference of one volt. So it's about 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And you can put an SI prefix in front of that. So a mega electron volt is 10 to the 6 electron volts, giga 10 to the 9, tera 10 to the 12, and the largest you're ever likely to encounter in the field, at least at the moment, is a peta electron volt, which is 10 to the 15 electron volts. So radioactive decay was limited in energy. The other source that was used at the time, which was cosmic rays, was limited by availability. So what do I mean by that? Well, the first problem you had is that the detectors at that time required direct interaction with the particles. And so that meant you had to put your detector where the particles were. Now, cosmic rays are particles that come from outer space and strike the top of the Earth's atmosphere, generating showers of secondary particles that sky, you know, come down from the sky and do, in fact, make it all the way to the surface. The problem is, is if you want to access the highest energy particles and see the, sort of the, the physics that's going on there, you need to have your detector way up there in the sky to see the primary particles or close to the primary particles coming in and interacting. That meant that people built their detectors on the tops of mountains, and in fact you can actually see one not far from uh, Edmonton. If you go to Banff and you go up the Banff gondola, you can see the site of the old Sulphur Mountain Cosmic Ray Observatory uh, that's at the top there. You have to walk a little bit from the uh, top of the gondola, but they have a, a plaque commemorating the site of the Cosmic Ray Observatory there. The other alternative is that you put your detector in a balloon and launch it. The problem you have is that as you go up and up and up in energy in your cosmic rays, you get fewer and fewer and fewer cosmic rays, and so you need a bigger and bigger detector in order to be able to see a reasonable number. And obviously, if you're on the top of a mountain or launching from a balloon, you're pretty limited in the size of the detector that you can build. And so those experiments also ran into limitations because of that. What we really needed to get further was a source in the laboratory of high energy particles. What we needed was a particle accelerator. Now the world's first particle accelerator was invented in 1930 by Cockroft and Walton who were working at the Cavendish lab of Cambridge University. And their accelerator was incredibly simple. It was just an enormously large electrical potential difference. And what they did was they injected hydrogen near the anode of this uh, huge potential difference and that stripped the electrons from the hydrogen uh, molecules, leaving protons, which were then repelled by the anode and attracted by the cathode, and they had a potential difference of 750 kilovolts between the two. So by the time the protons reached the uh, cathode, which was designed so that they would sail through it, they had acquired an energy of 750 kilo electron volts. Now, even at the time, that was a pretty modest energy. You remember back, in fact, in, in before the invention of this, people were using radioactive sources which had mega electron volt energies. So 750 kilo electron volts wasn't particularly impressive. However, they were accelerating protons, and radioactive sources do not kick out protons quite so easily. 
And with this source of protons, they managed to induce the first artificial nuclear reaction. They bombarded their protons onto lithium, and that caused the lithium nuclei to split into two hydrogen nuclei, or two alpha particles. And for that, they won the Nobel Prize. Now, they managed to improve on their design in 1932, and they got it up to about one mega electron volt. The way they did this is the first accelerator used something that's still actually used today to generate high voltages. It's called a Cockroft Walton generator, or a capacitor diode ladder, which can convert a low voltage AC source into a very high voltage DC source. And they replaced that with, in fact, just a simple Van de Graaff generator. So just a belt that, that carried electrostatic charge. And there they managed to get the energy up to about a mega electron volt. But that was pretty much the limit of what you could do, because after that you ran into problems with the breakdown of air. And so that limited the you know, potential difference that you could do in this sort of one-step accelerator. And so that was really as far as you could go with their simple Cockroft-Walton accelerator. However, their design, although now much improved and, and modified, is still at the start of almost all particle accelerator chains because it's a great way to produce a source of protons. Although now they do things differently, they actually tend to add electrons rather than subtract them, at least initially, because that breaks up the hydrogen molecules a lot more efficiently. So Cockroft-Walton generator, while it's very, very uh, limited in energy, is still in use today. Now, we only have to wait one year for the next leap forward in accelerator technology. That came in 1933, one year after Cockroft and Walton improved their accelerator, but it didn't come from the UK, it came from the other side of the pond in the US, where Ernest Lawrence invented the cyclotron. Now what Lawrence did was he added to the idea of an electrical field accelerating the particles, he added a magnetic field to bend the particles round so that they would encounter the same electrical accelerating potential time and time again. Now the way his cyclotron worked is he took essentially the pole of a magnet which had a uniform uh, magnetic field. He then split that pole into two halves, right? So we have a circular pole, you split it into two halves, you give one half a positive potential and one half a negative potential. And if you have, for example, a proton, when it encounters the gap between those two halves, it will be accelerated across the gap. And then, because it's moving, it'll be bent round in a circle. Now, if all you did was you had a static potential, of course, by the time it had gone through half a circle, it would now encounter the electrical potential, but of course, the potential would be the wrong way around. It would slow it down. So what Lawrence did was he made the potential difference between the two halves of the cyclotron oscillate at a particular fixed frequency, so that when the proton had gone through half of its orbit, by the time it came back to the gap, the polarity had flipped and it got another kick of energy because now it was going from, negative, uh, from positive to negative. So it was repelled by one half and attracted by the other. It went through another half cycle. By the time it came back to the gap, the polarity had flipped again. So it always saw an accelerating potential. Now the reason this could work was because of something known as the cyclotron resonance. So the radius of curvature of a charged particle moving through a constant magnetic field is proportional to the momentum of the particle. And for a classical particle, we're talking here non-relativistic particle, for a classical particle, the momentum is proportional to the velocity. So the radius of curvature of a charged particle in a constant magnetic field is proportional to the velocity of the particle. But the length of one of these half tracks in the cyclotron is proportional to the radius. So the distance that the particle had to travel became proportional to the velocity of the particle, which meant that the particle always took a fixed time to go round its orbit, no matter what the radius of that orbit was. 
and that's how the cyclotron always made sure that the particle was accelerated when it came to the gap. However, there are some limitations with the design. The first is, is that as you build up energy, Lawrence got his first one up to uh, 4.8 mega electron volts, and by 1939 he'd improved it up to 16 mega electron volts. However, if you start going much above that, you run into a problem where the particle now is not classical, it starts to follow the rules of relativity. And of course what that means is that the momentum is no longer proportional to the velocity, and so the period of the orbit starts to change. And there is a solution to that, and that is to, as the particles gain in energy, you change the frequency at which you're oscillating the electric field, and that was actually called a synchro cyclotron. And in fact, the largest cyclotron ever built um, is not far from here, at the Triumph Laboratory in Vancouver, and that's an 18 meter diameter and produces 520 mega uh, electron volt protons. And of course, that's really a synchro cyclotron because at that energy, the protons are clearly relativistic particles. But the other limitation is the fact that you, know, you have to contain the particle orbit inside the poles of a magnet. And that means you either need an insanely strong magnetic field or you need a very, very big magnet. Um, and, you know, very wide poles in order to be able to contain the track of the particle. And that also puts a limit on the energy. And the solution to that was to move away from the cyclotron design and into something where the electric and magnetic fields were always operated in synchronization. And that was called the synchrotron. So to push energies beyond the limitations of the cyclotron, or even synchrocyclotron, the design of accelerators moved from having a single vacuum chamber between the poles of a magnet to having a vacuum tube that went round in a circle. And on that tube, in that tube, you put various components. So to accelerate the particles, you would put a microwave cavity, and that would generate microwaves, just like your microwave oven, but a bit more powerful. And the charged particles then surf on that electromagnetic wave, gaining energy from it and being accelerated. Following that, of course, you then put bending magnets that would bend the particles round in a loop and feed them back in through the microwave cavity where they get another kick of acceleration and so they keep gaining energy. And then to keep the particles moving on this circular trajectory, you had to increase the current in the magnets gradually so that the magnetic field increased so that the particles were kept on a circular track. And that's why the uh, accelerators became known as synchrotrons, because you synchronized the magnetic field to the energy of the particles. Now, the world's first synchrotron was built in 1950 at the Lawrence Berkeley uh, National Laboratory in the US. And as you can see from the pictures, this would actually fit inside a large room, but it was still fitting inside a large room. But the other thing to notice is the insanely large size of the beam. And the beam was meters across. And you can see that from the photo with the people standing on top of the beam line, right? Now, admittedly, the shielding around it, there's concrete shielding, but it was a huge beam. And the reason for this was because of the way particle accelerators work. Now, often this is sometimes referred to as beam optics because the mathematics is almost identical to that of uh, optical beams. Now, what that means is that essentially for a charged particle uh, beam, in the vast majority of cases, unless you're doing something specialized, something called Louville's theorem applies. And what that means is if you look at the divergence uh, between the particle's actual, particle's actual velocity um, and the direction that you want it for the perfect orbit, that divergence between them, if you integrate that over the size of the beam, the area of the beam, you will end up with a constant. 
So what that means is, is that if you shrink the beam down and you make it small, you will end up with a large divergence of particle uh, velocities. And so of course the beam will then immediately uh, you know, explode outwards and start hitting the sides of the accelerator. And of course at that point you start losing the beam and, and it's not going round and round and round. And so the solution at the time was to make enormously large beams so that then of course with a huge area you have a very very small divergence because you integrate the divergence over the area you get a constant large area means you have a small divergence and so that's how they were built at the start of the synchrotron era with uh, uh, something called weak focusing and obviously that was a problem because if you wanted to scale these machines up to even higher energies then it became it was impossible because you'd have an enormous vacuum pipe that would be uh, you know as we now know from the scale of the LHC you know tens of kilometers long and that's just not practical to construct now the Bevatron nevertheless was a huge success it was called Bevatron because it was the first accelerator to exceed a giga electron volt in fact it actually had an energy of 6.3 giga electron volts now it was called Bevatron instead of Gigatron because the giga prefix in the SI system was only adopted in 1960 10 years after the Bevatron was um, built so the Bevatron was built to discover the antiproton, which it did um, with an energy, uh, since it had a beam energy of 6.3 GeV, it saw antiprotons. So the next uh, advance in accelerator design was something called strong focusing that allowed us to shrink the size of the beam enormously. Now the world's first accelerator to use strong focusing was CERN's proton synchrotron. It was also the very first synchrotron accelerator built at CERN. And it was built nine years after the Bevatron in 1959. Now, the way that strong focusing worked is you put quadrupole magnets in the beam. And when the beam passes through a quadrupole magnet, it's not exactly the same as a, as a lens in an optical uh, beam. Um, what happens is the beam is focused in one direction and defocused in the other. So for example, if you pass the beam through a quadrupole with one particular polarity, it'll focus it in the X direction and defocus it in the Y direction. Now, ordinarily this would be bad because of course now you've defocused it in the Y, the particles will spread out and eventually they'll hit the sides of the tube and then you'll lose them. However, in strong focusing, what you do is before they have a chance to spread too far, you put them through another quadrupole magnet with the opposite polarity. So the second quadrupole magnet now focuses in Y and defocuses in X. And so the particles never get a chance to move away or move very far from the center of the beam, but the beam does sort of slightly oscillate uh, in size in X and Y, but out of phase because you're always focusing in one and defocusing in the other. And this is, is very similar, in fact, to the way a telephoto lens works, which consists of alternate, you know, uh, diverging and converging lenses to generate uh, its image. So this scheme of strong focusing where you're converging and diverging all the time in the two X and Y directions around the beam, it allows you to reduce the beam size by an insane numbers of orders of magnitude. So if you remember in the 1950s with the Bevatron, you had beams that were measured in meters. They were you know, a couple of meters in diameter. Today, for example, with the Large Hadron Collider, we have a beam size that is 3.5 micrometers. And even smaller than that, if you look at the Super Keck uh, B, uh, B factory, that's an E plus E minus machine, E plus E minus collider in Japan, they have achieved a beam size of 50 nanometers in one direction, but it is 10 uh, micrometers wide. So strong focusing really enormously reduced the size of the vacuum tube that you needed to have to build an accelerator and made these large machines that we see today practical.
Now today, all of our ex modern accelerators that are used for, for particle physics research are synchrotron machines. Cyclotrons do exist, but you find those typically in the basements of hospitals because they're used to create medical isotopes. But for going for very intense, very high energy beams, you need a synchrotron. Now, if you look at a diagram of the CERN accelerator complex, you can actually see that things are not just, you don't just sort of have the Large Hadron Collider and inject protons at rest into the Large Hadron Collider and off you go. The reason for this is that synchrotrons can generally only accelerate particles over about an order of magnitude in energy. And so what that means is that if you want to get up to energies like the Large Hadron Collider, you need an accelerator complex that accelerates the particles in stages. The reason for this is that um, when you uh, synchrotrons, magnets and things ramp up and down in synchronization with the beam energy and when you start to get to very low energies it becomes very difficult to control these magnets precisely enough to maintain the orbits and so you don't lose the particle beam because if you have one magnet that's just slightly out you got to remember these things are going round you know many many times a second and so one magnet that's slightly out will cause the beam very rapidly to destabilize. So typically, uh, and it, you know, accelerators will only go up in an, or by an order of magnitude. So the CERN accelerator complex starts with a source of hydrogen, and that hydrogen um, is in fact now injected into a linear accelerator. And what they do is they actually add electrons to the hydrogen because then that will split a hydrogen molecule into negative hydrogen ions. And that's a lot more efficient than trying to do what Cockcroft and Walton originally did, which is remove electrons. The reason for that is because if you remove one electron from a hydrogen molecule, sometimes it doesn't split up. Sometimes it remains bound as a positively charged hydrogen molecule, H2+, and of course that has twice the mass of a proton. It'll get ejected from the beam because the beam's designed to accelerate protons, um, and so it's inefficient to, to do that. So the protons are fed into a, a, a linear collider, uh, sorry, linear accelerator that will accelerate them up to about two giga electron volts, and then they're passed through uh, a um, positively charged membrane that strips the electrons off them, and what you're left with at that point are two GeV protons that are injected into the proton synchrotron. And that's the same proton synchrotron that was the world's first strong focused accelerator. Now, the proton synchrotron accelerates them from 2 GeV up to 26 GeV, and that's giga electron volts, and then they are injected into the super proton synchrotron. Um, that was a uh, that was actually built as a collider uh, that made some pretty uh, interesting discoveries that we'll talk about in the next video. Um, but in this case, it's been operated simply as an accelerator, and it accelerates uh, the protons up to 450 giga electron volts. At that point, the protons are injected into the Large Hadron Collider. And it takes about 4 minutes and 20 seconds to fill uh, the beams in the Large Hadron Collider with enough protons. And then at that point, the uh, collider, the LHC, switches to acceleration mode and ramps up the energy of the beams over, I think it's about 20 minutes, until they reach an energy of 6.5 tera electron volts making the Large Hadron Collider the highest energy collider, or in fact accelerator, in the world. Now one of the most striking things about modern particle accelerators is their sheer size. The Large Hadron Collider has a circumference of 27 kilometers. It crosses an international border and it contains several villages inside the ring. In fact, I know because I've lived in two of them uh, over my time at CERN. Now, the reason for this is not because particle physicists just like building really big machines. In fact, the Large Hadron Collider is, is often uh, called the biggest machine uh, in the world because of its sheer size. The reason high energy uh, colliders have to be so enormous is because of the physics and technological limitations. So there are two typical particles that are accelerated in machines, electrons 
and protons. And these are both stable particles, which is why they're chosen, but each of them has their own problem, which requires, if you're using a circular uh, uh, accelerator, requires a very large radius. Now, for protons, the reason you need this radius is simply because you need an enormous magnetic field to bend the protons round in a ring. The bending magnets in the Large Hadron Collider are 9.6 Tesla, which is, at the time it was built, the upper limit of what you could reliably produce. There are magnets out there that can produce stronger magnetic fields, but remember, you need a 27 kilometer ring that is full of these magnets, and they have to operate reliably the vast majority of the time, despite the fact that you've got several thousand of them in the ring. So you can't have something that's a bit flaky or a bit on the edge of, of operating. You've got to have something reliable. And that's really what limits the energy of the Large Hadron Collider. If we could make stronger magnets, we could increase the energy of the machine. Now the reason for that is that the protons have a large mass, and so of course energy, they have a lot of momentum, and so bending them round requires a large magnetic field. So you could say, well, what about going for a less massive particle like the electron? The other advantage of the electron is the electron's a fundamental particle, and so in the collisions you get all the energy of the electron available. The Large Hadron Collider, when you're colliding protons, you do not have the full 13 tera electron volts of energy available to you. You typically, at most, will only get sort of six or seven as an absolute limit, and, and the higher energy you go, the less the number of particles are, and that's because protons are made up of smaller particles, so when they collide, you only get a fraction of the total energy of the proton available in the collision. So, switch to an electron machine, but there's a problem with electrons. And it also occurs with, with protons, but the, uh, when you accelerate a charged particle, a charged particle will radiate energy. And of course, when you're moving it round in a circle, it's continuously accelerating to the center of the circle, and so it is irradiating energy along a tangent. And that type of radiation is in fact named after the accelerators. It's called synchrotron radiation. Now, the problem with synchrotron radiation is that the amount, the power of radiation that's emitted is proportional to one over the mass of the particle to the fourth power. Now, an electron is 1800 times uh, less massive than a proton, and so that's one over 1800 to the power four times more energy is radiated from an electron. And so the limit when you're accelerating electrons is that you can't, you know, you, you, you're losing energy because the particle's going around in a circle, it's accelerating, it's irradiating uh, all this energy away. And so <clears throat> your limit there is how fast can you accelerate it because it's losing energy so rapidly. And in fact, before the Large Hadron Collider, the same tunnel contained the Large Electron Positron Collider, LEP, and that had an energy limit for its collisions of about you know, 100 GeV per beam compared to the 6.5 TeV of the LHC with its proton beams. So electrons have a different problem that they lose energy too rapidly. Now you could look and say, well, what about going somewhere in the middle and have a look at a muon collider? And a place I worked when I was a, a postdoc called Fermilab in the States actually did an investigation about that. The problem with muons is they're unstable and decay. So the first problem you've got to do is you've got to accelerate them really fast, right? Uh, you've got to get them up to high energy fast because then time dilation means, means they last a lot longer. But you've also got to have a very large number of them. And the nice thing with muons is they're a fundamental particle like the electron. They're a lot more massive, 200 times more massive than the electron, so synchrotron radiation is a lot lower, um, but you have to produce a lot of them and accelerate them fast. And the problem they did when they actually looked at the designs for this was that they had a problem with the radiation from the accelerator. And the radiation from the accelerator was not synchrotron radiation. When muons decay, as we saw, they decay into two neutrinos. And they had dangerous amounts of neutrino, uh, uh, neutrinos being emitted uh, from the accelerator. Uh, so they had a sort of oval accelerator with these long arms and basically it produced 
incredibly intense neutrino beams that would have been fantastic for doing physics, but the problem is, of course, is if you've got dangerous amounts of neutrino radiation, you can't shield that, right? So they, you know, their designs were things like putting the accelerator on a tilt so that one beam would sort of go through the Earth and by the time it emerged the other side it would be diffuse, and then the beam that shot up into the air would just be an aviation hazard with a, you know, planes don't fly through here and birds, you know, cross your fingers if you do. Um, however, you know, it turned to be too expensive and too impractical, so it never got built. Now, <clears throat> so that's why we have to have these enormously large machines, and in fact, the next generation of electron-positron machine that's been discussed is in fact a linear collider, simply because it would be cheaper to build a linear collider than a circular uh, collider, because even though the beam only passes once through each microwave cavity, you don't get to reuse it, it's actually you need a shorter beam length, which of course makes things cheaper, uh, and just pack it with microwave cavities, that's cheaper than building an insanely large radius uh, circular accelerator. So that's the state of the art for current accelerators. We're still using magnets and microwave cavities, the basic technology that we've been using since the 1950s, although of course now it's superconducting uh, uh, magnets and incredibly precisely machined microwave cavities. The next generation of, of uh, accelerators, people are forever exploring new technologies. CERN has what's called the CERN uh, Linear uh, Collider Click, and that is looking at actually using a low energy beam to accelerate a high energy beam because you can get a far larger accelerating gradient. So in other words, the, you know, the, the number, the gain in energy per unit length can be increased using that sort of approach. But again, it's the same sort of microwave cavity type linear accelerator design, just with a novel means to, to, to power it. Other approaches are also looking at whether we can use sort of laser generated plasmas to accelerate particles. These can produce incredibly impressive accelerating gradients. You can get, I think now the record is sort of like a GeV over a few centimeters, which is incredible. Um, but there's lots of problems with reliability, reproducibility, and certainly with intensity. And then of course the fact you need to sort of chain all these things together. It's no use just having you know, an acceleration of one GeV. You need to be able to string lots of these together and get up to very high energy. So, People are exploring new methods to accelerate particles, but so far the only way we have to get to the energies to do our research are the tried and tested means of magnets and microwaves. Now, with the particle accelerator back in the 1950s, the field was revolutionized. As we talked about in the last video, these accelerators opened the door to what became known as the particle zoo. New particles were popping out every time you turned a new accelerator on and got up to a new energy, new particles were found, and nobody had a clue what was going on. So in the next video, we'll talk about how the initial um, efforts to bring order to this chaos resulted in what was called the Eightfold Way, and how in 1974 that led to what became known as the November Revolution and the birth of the Standard Model. Music